Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from across the world. Thank you for joining today's HFS webinar on integrated automation that's emerging as the secret sauce to scale up automation initiatives. My name is Saurabh Gupta. I am the Chief Strategy Officer for HFS and I lead our global research initiatives and I'll be your host today. Before uh, we get started, let me get some housekeeping out of the way. So we, we definitely want to hear from you and we want to keep it interactive. Uh, we'll also reserve some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Uh, but to submit your questions, uh, look at the bottom of your window and click on the Q&A uh, button to submit a question. So please, please keep these questions coming in and I'll try to ask some questions as we go through, uh, but we'll also reserve some time at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the session. I'm very pleased to be joined by four esteemed panelists from across the globe um, today, and I'd like all of them to quickly introduce uh, themselves. Um, let's uh, start with Roger. Yes, hi everybody. This is Roger Yaussi speaking. I'm uh, Head of Automation and Operational Excellence at Swisscom, and I look very much forward to share with you our automation journey and some learnings later in this session. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Patrick? Yes, hi, my name is Patrick Williamson. I run product development for Arago and the, our AI automation solution, Hero, and look forward to sharing with you the, some of the fundamentals. Thanks, Patrick. Tom? Hi, Tom Reiner, Head of Strategy at Arago. That's mostly at the moment a strategic marketing influence management and as a former alumni or alumni of HFS, I'm delighted to be back on the other side of the fence. Awesome. And last but not the least, Tapti. Tapti, we can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Uh, this is Tapati. I am the Vice President um, Research at HFS and I lead the Artificial Intelligence Research Agenda along with uh, Manufacturing as a Vertical and Industry 4.0 and IoT are also part of my coverage. Glad to be here. All right. Thank you, everyone. This is going to be interesting as we, as we cover what is uh, integrated on automation, the concept of it. Uh, we'll then ask Tapti to share a little bit on the current state of adoption. Um, we'll, we'll then listen to both Tom and Patrick uh, to share how they are uh, at Arago approaching this space. Um, we'll ask Roger to tell us about his journey, uh, his automation journey at Swisscom. And then we'll all discuss uh, some war stories and some battle scars and understand what are the big, biggest hurdles and what were the lessons learned uh, before we get into the Q&A. So let us start with what is integrated automation, right? What, what does it mean? And I think all of, uh, <clears throat> all of you would agree that the, the global C-suite has been enamored by a number of emerging technologies, right? We at HFS, uh, call them the AAA trifecta of uh, automation, analytics, and artificial intelligence. And these technologies no doubt uh, promise disruptive benefits, uh, but the conversation today has been overpowered by technology. Just like we realize that throwing bodies of people at a business problem does not really solve it, uh, we are starting to realize that just by making investments in technology is not going to help us realize those ambitious uh, goals or the promise that these technologies have. And as a result, we came up with this uh, framework of integrated automation, which is when the HFS AAA trifecta of automation analytics and AI is balanced across the original enterprise trifecta of people, process, and technology. And I think the technology circle is becoming far, far bigger uh, today than people and process. And I, and I hope um, through this conversation and several others, we are able to achieve that balance because that's when we truly believe um, we can realize the, the promises that these technologies truly have. The one other confusion uh, that I want to dispel early on is what is AI? 
And in the number of conversations that we have, people tend to discuss AI as if it is a monolith or a single category, right? Where in fact, there are many, many specialized AI subcategories for specific things. Uh, so to clarify matters, we at HFS classify AI into three broad groups. Um, the first one is foundational AI, which includes machine learning, deep learning, which are fundamental technologies because they underpin the current breed of all AI systems. Focused AI focuses on technologies like natural language processes and computer vision, which, which specialize in specific tasks like semantic understanding or image uh, recognition. And then packaged AI includes autonomics and cognitive assistance, which, which are AI forms characterized by being user or consumer facing with the backend uh, being pretty much invisible. To the end user. I think the, the fundamental point or the key takeaway on this slide is that AI is not just one thing uh, and understanding the nuances or, or the different forms of AI is important for us to drive uh, real value. So with those with those definitions out of the way, um, let me ask my colleague Tapti to help us understand the current state of adoption based on some of the recent research work that we've done. Tapti? Yeah, thanks, Saurav. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, the kind of uh, targets or kind of objectives that most of our enterprise uh, AI leaders are looking for from integrated automation, intelligent automation kind of technologies. So uh, quite contrary to uh, you know the top, the you know the popular narrative, uh, what uh, we see is that uh, instead of uh, looking at AI or intelligent automation for reducing the number of FTEs or reducing the operational costs or just uh, increasing the operational efficiency, many organizations are looking at using AI for competitive advantage, using AI for driving revenue growth. Um, if you see the, you know, 24% uh, of our clients, respondents are looking at using um, intelligent automation for revenue growth, profitability, new markets, new customers, new kind of product offerings and service offerings. And uh, if you see the right side of the chart, you see that uh, a lot of them, more than 50% of them actually, 53% are looking at using these technologies for improving the customer journeys, customer experience, you know, servicing the customer personas, different kind of customer personas better and integrating them as uh, as a de facto delivery mechanism for their digital value propositions, which depend on mass personalization. When we look at the next slide, we see that, uh, you know, as Saurav mentioned, that uh, when we talk about integrated automation, uh, it's not a single technology and not a single kind of uh, platform or solution can be the silver bullet. So most of the uh, you know, good use cases are complex, but they are combinations of, they are like multiplexed uh, solutions of combining um, uh, analytics, computer vision, uh, machine learning. Uh, you know, many of these are parts of artificial intelligence, uh, core APIs to applied AI uh, use cases. So essentially um, we see that a lot of organizations are uh, getting into the AI space, but uh, most of them have already started their robotic pro process automation journeys as well. And slowly they are realizing the fact that just, you know, one single tool will not give them uh, much of a value and they are moving towards more and more integration. So that is where in fact we see that, uh, you know, the AAA trifecta, as we have mentioned, uh, analytics, AI and automation coming together is where the nirvana state of uh, intelligent automation, integrated automation will be achieved. But unfortunately, uh, while more than 60% of organizations are using multiple AI technologies or IA technologies, only 11% of them are actually taking an integrated solution approach. That means that suppose they take a business process end to end, which can be you know, procurement as a process or supply chain, uh, you know, the upstream downstream activities, or financial accounting, any of these processes, they are not looking at end-to-end -end kind of a process chain or a value stream uh, where, you know, bits and pieces of it can be done by RPA, bits and pieces require AI, 
bits and pieces can be done by predictive analytics or ML. So that is where, in fact, less than uh, you know, 15% organizations are actually looking at an integrated value chain with all these technologies put together and talking to each other. So that's the state of affairs as of now. And that is where, in fact, we uh, see that an enterprise-wide approach to integrated automation is, uh, is visible probably only for the uh, very mature kind of uh, client organizations. Uh, uh, some of the BFSI clients or telecom clients uh, like Swisscom, we have a presentation here. So uh, there, in fact, we see uh, you know, the approach towards enterprise-wide adoption is uh, being uh, uh, you know, tracked very aggressively. And that is the way forward. That is the best practice. We want more, more and more organizations to uh, take as an approach. Thanks, Tapti. I think that was uh, that was very interesting. I think we 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 seem to have a lot of ambitious uh, objectives from from these emerging technologies, uh, but we still seem to be using them in a very piecemeal way. Uh, even if you look at it either from a technology adoption perspective, everybody is throwing money at all these technologies, but they're not integrating them, uh, or from an enterprise perspective, there are pockets of uh, uh, pockets within the enterprise uh, that are testing and piloting and doing POC, uh, but we haven't seen uh, sort of rapid scaling up uh, on an enterprise-wide basis. So given given those adoption pattern, let me turn to um, Tom, maybe if you can help us articulate how Arago is, uh, is approaching this, uh, this adoption curve uh, to help clients realize these, I think, very ambitious goals that they have. No, thanks, Saurabh. And all what you guys have just presented really resonates with us and reflects many discussions we are having at Arago. But provided we are not confining it to the inflationary RPA discussion, but applying it or this mindset to both IT and business processes. In particular, and Tatapti was alluding to it, organizations shouldn't fall into the trap and believe that any individual tool set could overcome their challenge with the processes and the whole landscapes. And we all probably remember the wondrous early discussion on RPA just far too well. So to your question, why are customers coming to us? Suffice it to say there are many reasons, but one theme keeps coming up time and again. And that is, how can we help the established economy to stay relevant? I mean, it sounds a bit trite, but it really is more of capture the point because they can't redesign their processes on a green field and yet they're bogged down by technical debt. That's really at the heart of all those discussions. At the same time, especially boards of our uh, clients and the people we talk to remain paranoid about disruption, but with the same token, they're still struggling to turn this paranoia into actionable mandates, especially for the operational teams. Having said all that, so how should you think about Arag and all those discussions, be it intelligent automation, the end of my view with the folks at HFS just spoke about integrated automation. And on this slide, you can find a couple of pointers. And if truth be told, if your value proposition is highly differentiated, which we believe some of we have, it is not easy to tell the story. There are now easy monikers you can just easily jump on. While the first bullet is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a reflection that in terms of technical capability, actually we're quite close to Google DeepMind. But as you might be aware, you can't buy Google DeepMind off the shelf. If you like, we have a DeepMind-like mindset, but actually we are applying all the research we have done, but we're doing it in a commercial context, and crucially, we're de delivering it at scale. As such, heroes are our core solution, is an, again, it's a bit of a mouthful, is an NI-enabled NI digital platform that can help clients to redefine their digital operations. And I don't mean redefining in the usual marketing hyperbole, but at the heart of our approach is capturing and codifying the knowledge of folks who are running operations. And again, Patrick will take you through the more details, but the fundamental difference from the broader AI discussion, which broadly speaking, focus much more on capturing data, analyzing data, and looking for patterns. And in terms of the AI capabilities, for me, two issues are standing out. First, we integrate a broad set of AI techniques and approaches to overcome the limitation of individual algorithms. Given the limited time that we have today, I just want to draw attention to the blend of machine reasoning and machine learning. 
yet critically those capabilities are part of one platform. With one platform, clients can dynamically scale any process. And as I said earlier, it's not just a business or IT process, but crucially it's both. And for me, that's really the essence of being digital or becoming digital. And we have to overcome the piecemeal many clients are facing today in terms of tool sets and technologies. The scale of what we're doing is furthermore accelerated by having one data pool for all the process. So again, it's all underpinned by, by one engine and one data pool. At least that's a vision, of course, it's a journey to get there. And if that's not enough, we are driving all those capabilities all the way to autonomous execution if clients are happy to do that. So again, it's not just looking at ways of analyzing data, but looking more almost if a client is happy to follow our approach, driving it all the ways to autonomous execution. But our platform approach has another facet. And it's not just another moniker, and it's more of a refreshing disc discussion, not least with the good folks at HFS, other analysts about the platform moniker. But really, clients can build their own solution on top of our platform. And this is why we position Hero, as, an, as I mentioned, in our enabled digital platform. At the moment, you can find similar capabilities only with a big platform company. Think of uh, the folks like Facebook, Baidu, or Google, but crucially, can't buy those capabilities. I said to say, as I mentioned, he can buy Hero. Mm. And the last point on the slide, our R&D team really is doing fundamental AI research. I already, already spoke about the comparison to DeepMind. And with a long-term approach, we have created many new class of algorithms. At least, I'm, I'm quite honest, I'm struggling to understand and comprehend all the stuff we are doing. It's really complex stuff. And lastly, and for me at least quite refreshingly, uh, our st uh, team doesn't sit in Silicon Valley or in Bangalore, but in charming Frankfurt with a strong European heritage. Next slide, please. Sorry. And the next slide is meant to give you a sense of strategic value we're applying to Hero or the way we are trying to articulate it to our clients. Allow me just to pick out a few. To take advantage of Hero and probably at AI, AI at large, it really is about changing a mindset. Far too often we're seeing clients just sprinkling machine learning or individual algorithms across their operations. For us, it is about progressing toward the management, the automation of knowledge. Again, not just the analysis of historical data. Again, Patrick will talk you through that in a moment. And I spoke already about the platform strategy. Clients can manage the complexity of the digital operation, but critically with one engine, and that end to end. And this might be a good segue to our capability to scale. I sort of was alluding to it, the central theme for the discussion today. And for me, the crucial element for scaling is the ability of Hero to retain knowledge. Once it's understood an issue, you don't have to start from scratch for every process. And this is pretty much a marked difference, for instance, from most of the RPA deployments we have seen, because you have to start from scratch for most uh, problems. But the scalability can also be seen by the fact that we're having discussion around IoT and in autonomous driving scenarios. We really take industrial, talking industrial scale here. And especially in comparison to RPA scenarios, which are much more confined, but with sort of starting uh, to talk to RPA vendors about managing exemption handling or even being the orchestrator for other automation tools. And then if these uh, discussions come to vision, would be positioned, we're very happy to, of course, to take on. And lastly, the notion of the ecosystem means also that clients don't have to throw out the existing tool set. Rather, we help them to, uh, I would trace ring fence those investments. Consequently, we're building connectors to the leading platform applications. And in a nutshell, we really optimize and orchestrate all those activities. And that was pretty much a whirlwind top level tour of around our capability and positioning. Suffice it to say, we would be happy to go much deeper if anybody is interested to learn more. But with that, I'm very happy to hand over to my colleague and really partner in crime in defining what we're doing. Patrick will try to give you much more sense how, of how Hero is actually working. Yeah. Patrick, so over before, you. Oh, before we move to Patrick, Tom, there's a question which yeah. I wanted to throw at you at this stage um, that we received. And the question is, is it always necessary to start with RPA? Can we not jump into AI straight away? Uh, what? What is your sort of experience? No, it's a good question. And it's a question I think over the years we have heard time and time again. 
there's not a logical starting point. You don't start some of even if you're talking about RPA scenarios are confined, RPA deployments are pretty much still quite static, although we're progressing with that, but it's not a logical starting point. So you don't have to start with any of all the technology we tend to subsume under the monocle intelligent automation. But it's always a combination or depends on the maturity of the client, the level of standardization, really the challenge they have. But again, this could be any other approach. So optimization can come in other ways. There's not almost a linear flow from one set of capabilities to another. If you get my drift, I hope that helps. Yeah, good, got it. All right, over to you, Patrick. Hello, yes, I had to make sure I had muted myself as well. Uh, so what I'd like to try to follow up on from Tom's introduction is to give a sense of when we talk about AI, what do we actually mean? Uh, AI and how, what does that mean within a hero context? And hero is our uh, flagship product. It is an automation product and we have taken various AI technologies, <coughs> put them together and turn it into an application that will automate, uh, that does automation for you. Uh, it is able to take in commands from various APIs. And we have a set of APIs such that it can connect to other uh, systems. These include uh, SAP, ServiceNow, uh, but it can also be used with other automation tools uh, such that it can either receive a request from an automation tools such as RPA to automate a task or to make a to automate a decision, or it can then reach out and send a command and start an initiator robot. So how does our solution, what is the, when we talk about AI and hero, what do we actually mean? What does, how does that come together? And it's a very nebulous topic. It's a very popular topic and it's also one that becomes very, it's being confused as it's being used in, uh, in many different contexts. So when we look at it and trying to put this together, put this into the context of current tools out there, we have uh, automation, what we call first generation automation AI, first generation implementation or first generation of AI being used, which is essentially looking at how do we automate the repetitive tasks. And this is a machine reasoning uh, type of perspective, but it's basically saying I have this task that I'm doing repetitively, and I would like to automate it and free up someone who is actually having to sit there and constantly do the same task. That's, it's the same logic, <clears throat> then it can be uh, automated via RPA, via script, via in the IT world, a tool called Runbook. It is uh, repetitive and basically recording those repetitive steps. The second generation, which is the machine learning, is automation of the predictable. So machine learning is essentially what we call pattern recognition. Uh, I've in the, often referred to it as a, it's a statistical representation, but it's looking at, let's automate what we can predict. So we don't have to know every single uh, potential step and every, so here's an invoice, <clears throat> with seven digits, here's an invoice with six digits, here's an invoice with five digits. We need to have a script or a robot for each one. Uh, exaggeration, but just to give an example, with the prediction uh, automation, we're basically saying, um, if we look at this image, we can predict that this handwriting is actually means this, so we can automate the recognition of that handwriting. Uh, it requires that we have enough data to be able to make a uh, to make a model off of that we can then predict an outcome so call that automation of what is predictable now what hero has done is basically to take those two and look at uh, and when you automate the repetitive you basically have to have a robot uh, that contains rules as to what to do in every single situation automation of the predictable you have to be able to build a really it's a statistical model, but when we talk about data model and talk about machine learning and big data analysis, we're basically looking for statistical patterns to be able to create a very large regression form or regression form or prediction formula and be able to say, in this, with this data points, do this. 
that requires that you have all of the data and you can and that you stick within the realm of that what that data is defined that doesn't represent most of our business uh, situations in for repetitive we need to have a rule for every single instance the world is constantly changing for predictable we need to have a very static environment so what we do with hero is we have basically said well look we've got to take a different approach when people are trained on doing a job or when a job is being done we tell somebody that when you're processing this invoice you need to do this step or um, you need to uh, that needs to go for approval if it has this uh, it needs to um, if it's different invoice different amounts there is a knowledge that is passed on or that people have as to what to do what we have done is to break those steps down into atomic steps of knowledge what we call or atomic level so small steps provide them with rules as to when they can be used under what condition and then using machine learning to say okay how do we then apply that so what we're another complex step so i've got another slide with a very simple the next slide is a very simple way of trying to demonstrate that but what we're trying to do is to say that when we when a human learns a task they learn small rules as to how to do things and what to try we then experiment within those rules to figure out the solution what hero is doing is breaking that down and saying okay let's do as the human does and make sure we can uh, take those small steps and come up with a solution so <clears throat> to try to illustrate that in this first example we have a somebody is sending an email this is I want to manually send an email these are the steps I need to do the first one is an example where there is a uh, CC uh, and two subject body text send that is what I do manually. The second step, I need to add an attachment. Well, I know what to do, I add an attachment. The third step, I don't have a CC, okay? I don't put the CC in. Now, if we go to uh, click next. So we just bring up the next, yes. So if I'm doing that in a repetitive automation, I need three robots. I have three different scenarios. I record each one as three different steps, and I then have the ability to automate sending an email. I need to record even to each individually as there's, as there's a variation. So what I come up with is an exact duplication in terms of the uh, number of robots to do as what a human would do in terms of different combinations. Now, when we go to how Hero approaches this problem, what we do is we break those down into those atomic steps. We have those as what we call knowledge items and uh, essentially, each one of those discrete or atomic steps is a individual bit of knowledge that the hero learns. It learns how to create an email, it learns how to add a to, a CC, a subject, it learns how to paste the body text, and it learns how to send. When we go to the next automate, the next uh, task that is sent in, which is to uh, add an attachment, it knows how to do everything except for adding an attachment. So all we need to do in terms of passing knowledge into hero is to add the attachment. The final scenario where all, I'm, all I've done is not add the CC, I don't need to do anything. I've already taught Hero how to do each of those individual steps. Hero is then able to say, ah, I know how to do that. I have, I've been asked to send an email. There's no CC, so I just don't add, there's no CC in the instruction set, so I just don't add a, the CC. We don't need to teach Hero anything. Now, these on the surface, these look very similar in terms of manual steps, robot steps, Hero uh, automation steps, three different scenarios. However, and at a very small scale, it's not that different in terms of implementation. Where it does get bigger is as soon as we start to scale. So if we go to the next slide. Where the value in Hero comes in is in scaling. At a, to initially set it up, in terms of understanding how to break down the knowledge, in terms of getting that recorded, we have a chatbot that <coughs> asks um, the, the user who's entering the knowledge questions to make it easy to add the knowledge. That is initially a higher amount of work to actually get that knowledge in. However, 
once we get to 20, 50, 100 tasks that are able to, uh, for automation into Hero, because Hero is able to reuse that knowledge that it's already learned, the effort required to add new tasks is greatly diminished because it's able to learn once and then reapply or recombine is the word we use, we use knowledge to find new solutions or to find solutions to new tasks as opposed to having to be taught specifically for this task you do this for this variant you do this for this variant you do this hero can look at a task and say ah i know ah, i know where to start ah, i know what to do i can figure out what's missing oh i i've learned this before i've learned this before and so what you get is that at scale hero is requires much much less input than traditional automated repetitive automation uh, products. And Hero is also requires, is in essence, if we look at it from a, a different perspective, when we're doing the, the repetitive automation, we are doing a, we're building a set of rules for every single variation. What Hero is doing is dynamically generating a solution every single time. And so the maintenance, is also greatly reduced. So there's, an, there's setting up the automation and then there is maintaining the automation. As Hero is able to recombine what new, new steps that it learns, new knowledge that it learns, it is able to recombine that and reuse that. The maintenance load is also much lighter. So this is where we really, the benefit comes at scale uh, in terms of amount of time required, or the, essentially the cost required to set it up. And then the complexity is greatly reduced in terms of maintenance, which also reduces the overall cost. So yep. that's hopefully a quick yeah, no, introduction. Patrick, that was, that was very helpful. Before, before we move on, there are a couple of questions um, that, I, that I wanted to ask you that uh, our audiences asked. Um, and I'll ask both of these together. So one question is, how does data analytics play into AI? Uh, and what's the, what's the role uh, that analytics play into this. And then the second question, which is more functionality, I think related is how do you, how do you at Arago sort of digitize the unstructured or semi-structured data like invoice data for image? So data, ana uh, data analytics is essentially uh, the, the way it's being used uh, it's actually your slides. Uh, the AAA trifecta. When we are doing a big data, when we're doing a big data uh, type of exercise, which is that we are pulling in uh, a large amount of data, then we are running machine learning uh, across that or some set of machine learning across that. It is coming up with uh, predictions, basically statistical model. Uh, it's a mathematical st statistical model to say, they, I have seen a pattern here. Um, this, I can now start to predict when this, and I've, it's resulted in this. And so I've actually seen something in the data whereby if I, this particular segment is reacting, this in a marketing context is actually reacting this way to the ad, which is not obvious, but with a large set of data, you can act, it's actually able to see it and make that and pull that out and then say, well, if you did this different activity, you would actually get a higher uptake. That is essentially data analytics. Uh, it's rolled into big data and then rolled into machine learning, uh, just as the, the buzzwords and the technologies move forward. But underlying it is the data analytics. And the second question, the, uh, the second question. structuring yes. unstructured, semi-structured data. So we, this actually is a machine learning problem. Uh, we are looking at automating processes. So we're looking, and a process typically has a series of steps. So one of those steps may be to, uh, yeah, to receive invoice data and based on uh, the sender and uh, the amount, uh, send on to a different uh, accounts payable person. Um, we do not look at automating, or we're not looking at the image recognition piece. 
which is a it's essentially a, 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 a statistical model to look at data and recognize what that in, that is based on the, the pattern. We don't actually do that. What we do is we would work, we, we would link with another partner or another technology that actually does that recognition is actually pulling out what the numbers are. They would send that information to us and then we would figure out what to do with it and then kick off the next step. So we, this is where we, we do not pretend to be AI covering everything. We are looking at more the automation of what, in a process where you have changing environment and where the inputs may vary, how, what, how do you react to that change? So we're looking at data, the data comes in, we have conditions, what do we do based on that situation? Next step, and what's the next step in the process? Start that off based on what's provided in. We would then look to a OCR or RPA or some other partner who would specialize in the actual scanning and taking that number, they would then send that to us. Understood. Hey, Patrick, that was very helpful. So let's <clears throat> let's move on to Roger. Roger, please help us. Now we've listened to an industry analyst who's talking broad trends. We've listened to a provider of, uh, of uh, an automation, AI-based automation tool. Uh, let's now hear from a client and your journey of uh, why you why you went this route and how you went about it yes okay thank you very much um let me first give you a little bit of context about the, the automation program i'm going to talk about and uh, the it's the program i'm responsible for and uh, i lead it is uh, very much Focusing on the engineering and operation division of Swisscom, That's, that means it's the division which is responsible for IT and network infra infrastructure, engineering and operation. And to have uh, an idea about the size, it's uh, an organization with around 2,000 people. Um, and we are on our journey to automate more and more of our provisioning and uh, operation processes and activities and uh, these are processes like uh, service fulfillment, incident management, problem management, change management, <clears throat> capacity management and, uh, and others. Uh, if I look back uh, a little bit on, on, on the timeline, um, so, somewhere around the end of 2016 until mid of 2017, uh, Swisscom piloted with uh, various automation tools and uh, at this moment then we decided for a selection and uh, among other tools we uh, chose Hero to start our automation uh, journey at this time. Uh, during this period we, we really tried different things and it was a lot of uh, exploration also. It, it was not um, uh, in early 2017 it was not a lot of concrete uh, automation or implementing already use cases and getting uh, very good uh, results in, uh, in automation to to be honest there and also that was an it was an important part for us so, or we needed that time to to get ready then to really uh, starting to be uh, productive with uh, with automation and uh, it's Important to mention then in, in autumn 2017, we totally changed the program and the setup of the program with a much more, uh, much more uh, clear focus on execution. Uh, that was important that, that at that time we moved to a, a total uh, agile mode of uh, rollout. That means we we uh, started to work in uh, very clear squads for the different tools we used. We, we do not use only uh, <clears throat> Hero, we, we uh, automate with uh, different tools. And that was, by the way, uh, in, an important learning on, on our journey. We, at the beginning uh, of that journey, we, we thought, let's find one tool and automate with that tool more or less overall uh, this complex organization I, I mentioned here with uh, these 2000 people and very complex processes and and we yeah we had to find out and uh, make our learnings that this make no sense we 
changed that approach then and uh, really decided that we have different tools in place. We have some uh, robotic desktop automation topics to solve and work with uh, tools there. We have for sure rob robot uh, uh, process automation and we also uh, used very much the tools we already had in place in the organization. That means uh, in, in our cloud environments or, or uh, network environments, uh, the, the organization, the people, they worked already with tools which, which have more and more good features to automate. And it was very important for the success of the program that we take that with us, that we are not coming with an, a message from a central uh, program uh, with a message, okay, we do now automation with these three, four tools and uh, everything what we had before maybe does not make a lot of sense. We had to empower them as well on what they do on the already existing tools, which makes sense for sure with, with, with uh, not, not every tool we took with us, but we have quite a broad uh, landscape with automation tools uh, around cloud and, and networks. And <clears throat> if we look now a little bit on, on the journey with, uh, with Hero, it is important to, to mention there that the, the real step we made at that moment, the, the real step to start to be successful with, uh, with Hero was at that moment when we decided to concentrate on one area, to start in one area with that tool uh, to automate exactly there and not having the idea to, to use Hero as from the beginning all over the organization because we had to build the interfaces to the, to the relevant systems. And this was just at the beginning not so successful because we wanted to do it all over the the, the engineering and operation division and we just uh, failed somehow with that. And then we decided to do it only in the environment of uh, incident management and event management. That means we had to build up the interfaces to the relevant systems in exactly that field. We did that till mid of 2018, around that. And then we have been really ready and able to start and, uh, and do quite fast implementation of uh, uh, use cases on, on Hero. For sure, besides what I mentioned now, we have to, to build up skills and people. We, we have a, a team uh, available now with around eight people, skilled people, which uh, are able to do and implement uh, cases on, on Hero. And that brought us to quite good results. Uh, as you can, can see on the slide, we, we have been able since uh, mid of uh, 2018 uh, to realize 42 use cases with uh, a result of uh, around 50, uh, 57,000 automated hours. That means reduced work, reduced manual work. Um, and this is all around this specific field of incident management, problem management, and uh, change management. What is also important to mention, because that was for us the, yeah, the, the real good thing and also somehow a differentiator to other tools, to other automation tools. We really realized we scale with Hero. We, we have not been able to say that, that at the beginning. We, we really also, we doubted uh, a little bit about that, uh, to, be, to be honest. And uh, if I look back now, we can say we implemented maybe the half of this result. That means the half of the cases and maybe the half of this around 60,000 hours reduced work. We realized between mid 18 and end 18, and the other half we realized now in the first three months of uh, 19. That means we really became uh, much faster in uh, doing automation or, or implementing automation on, on Hero. And the main reason is, uh, as mentioned here as well on the slide, is 
<coughs> we we uh, have been able to use this uh, reusable code, this knowledge items uh, explained also before, uh, much more in detail uh, by, by Patrick. And this allowed us to, to do more and more uh, cases within shorter time and really reuse uh, code. And that uh, is also uh, very, very much the, the USP we see now from, from here. We really can say today, and that was not always like that, as mentioned before. Today we can say we implement the most and uh, the, the also really fast if you compare it with the other automation tools we have have uh, in place we implement the most with uh, with hero now so we had uh, to 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 take that together a little bit we had a quite hard and and long journey um, and we are for sure not uh, at the end of, of this journey but uh, we are on a point now where we can say we we have real results and good results with in, in general with uh, our automation approach, but uh, very much also with, uh, with Hero. Um, hey Roger, that was very interesting. There's one question that I wanted to ask you that we've received, um, which is, which says a portion of exciting automation initiatives are piecemealed, fragmented, and they often fail to deliver because the technology capability was oversold <laughs> and the question really is for you as to how did you clearly sort of differentiate between all the capabilities in the automation market offering to choose whatever you chose <clears throat> yeah Let, uh, let's answer it uh, first in in that way we are today we are absolutely not sure if we have uh, uh, what, what, how can I say, finally the best tools in place which uh, are around in the market because you uh, have uh, such a fast development of new capabilities and tools that we always are challenged to understand what happens there, what, what happens in the market and we could uh, take in another tool uh, more or less every day but finally we, we have a set of uh, around five, six core uh, uh, tools we automate with and we we decided it on, on the, that basic first it was really we had to learn it was at the beginning I remember we tried to do quite a lot with automation anywhere in in uh, fields where we after a while understood this makes no sense we still work with automation anywhere and it makes a lot of sense in, in a few fields uh, and parts of the organization, but it it was it was a learning journey, and and around uh, this timeline, as I mentioned before, mid of uh, 2018, we came to a point where we have we felt good to say, okay, let's go with this, this, and this, and and Hero was uh, one of these tools. But we are very much uh, uh, concentrating on uh, trying to understand what's going on. Uh, there with new tools and we we also we, we have some resources available to do little pox with, with new things uh, and we will may change also again but, or take in something else and push out something we, we already have. But it, is a, <laughs> it is a really it is a really a real complexity to to <laughs> to to manage that also because you for sure you have a lot of pressure coming from the company to the, the, the main understanding at the beginning was I mentioned it and that comes for, for, for sure uh, from from the uh, very much from from the management level try to do it with one or two tools and uh, we had to uh, become we have to, we had to come to clear results in automating with different tools and being able to present uh, a story, a successful story with that. And now I think we, we are solid uh, with that approach. No, that's, that's great, uh, Roger. And 
talking about complexities let's let's maybe move the discussions a little bit to to what are the challenges and uh, i'd like tapti if you can help us understand a little bit of what you are seeing in your research as to what are the broad challenges in in getting to that promised land yep thanks sir uh, this has been uh, uh, very uh, insightful for us all um uh, when we see the survey results again you know we see that uh, scaling is actually the biggest challenge that uh, most of our client leaders are experiencing so the top 3 essentially are scaling and uh, what uh, roger was mentioning about the top management asking for the roi justifications on investments in intelligent automation so that's number 2 and essentially um, you know lack of clarity in terms of the organization who drives the uh, you know intelligent automation agenda whether it should lead it whether business teams should lead it or it should be a hybrid kind of an approach so these are the top 3 challenges and essentially uh, you know scaling is an empirical pain point because scaling is a problem which uh, you know which requires a very uh, balanced approach ac ac across people process technology so you cannot just uh, you know expect technology to scale by itself if people do not adopt and that is where we feel that the integration between technologies is the essential first step towards achieving scaling because technology is actually the easiest to integrate honestly speaking far easier to integrate you know than multiple departments or functions across organizations so we start with integration of technology and then in fact we look at you know end to end processes and how different tools come together to deliver that entire process as a value chain because if we don't integrate the you know the different tools rpa or ai or smart analytics ml whatever it is if we don't integrate those tools what will happen is different parts of an end to end process will have different kinds of speed right so in 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 such a situation in fact we will end up creating more bottlenecks than solving right that is where in fact you know a platform like euro which actually takes a lowest common multiple kind of an approach towards creating an integrated knowledge base or a pattern base first with the atomic ais and then dynamically combining them in runtime to solve different kinds of variations of processes that is the essential first step towards integrated automation and towards realizing value so all these return on investment stories can actually get much more boost if we look at integrated automation starting with automating uh, integrating the technologies and tools first yeah so thanks uh, thanks tapti i think there is a number of challenges and and roger maybe if i could bring you back into the discussion you've been at it for a few years now what what have been some of the major lessons learned from from your perspective yes and may i can answer also with that one of the other question i saw i saw in the chat now um i mean to to make go to to one question i see first uh, it was the question was how did you organize that uh, was it the coe or is it the coe approach uh, you have a center of excellence approach <clears throat> and we have a, a program organization which uh, is around it's quite small it's around 20 20 people these are uh, mainly two group of people one group is uh, a group of people finding use cases and getting them ready together with the business uh, people to get getting them ready to uh, automate it and implement it that's one part of the of the team and the other part of the team is uh, developers on on uh, different tools for sure this is the core we have uh, maybe around uh, uh, 50 people out of the organization i mentioned before which are more or less allocated to automation as well so it is a centralized approach but we we concentrate very much to to um to be very decentralized from a uh, uh bringing knowledge into the organization point of view uh, because that was 
at the beginning of our journey, it was a, an issue. We had a lot of feedbacks uh, in that direction that we heard uh, you, yeah, you, you are a centralized program now doing automation. You're far away from reality and what we do. And that means we, we had to, to do things and, and uh, decided to, to bring the people, these people in the program very much or very close to the organization. And I think that's, that was one of the success factors uh, we had last year to, to being able to, to come to good results. That's uh, maybe one thing. And if I look uh, or talk about the learnings I have on the slide here, it is, it is really much important that it has a senior management attention and to, to really say that it is, it is on every senior manager's list somehow, I, I think, or what I saw, but it has to be in, in their activities and in their time they spend on things uh, really much. Before that doesn't happen, it's uh, really hard to, to be successful. That again was a, a, a step we had to take. We are on a, on a good level there now. Um, then also, uh, it is really important that something where we failed at the beginning also or we had troubles uh, it's really important to differentiate it from a cost case um, it is for sure it has to do with efficiency no question but it it is much more an, an enabler also for for quality and um, and time to market uh, new revenue and it was one of the issues we had that people, if we came and wanted to talk about automation and they have to bring the cases, I mean, they have to come out of the organization. Then the, they stepped back and said, well, you want to uh, get costs down and reduce uh, FTEs. And we really had to differentiate that in that way that we said, we empower our human workforces with an increasing capable digital workforce and you can do with that whatever you want as a, a line organization you can we empower you with digital workforce and you do whatever you want may you have to reduce your teams okay then do it um, and then uh, really uh, it's important to not underestimate the, the, the change management aspect of uh, automation it takes a lot of time of of senior management to talk about all these things uh, I mentioned before and it's just work going on every weekend month we, we spend time on that. and for us it was really important to move fast into an HR setup with very clear uh, releases uh, of 10 weeks and, and having very clear results after 10 weeks and then going into the next release and having and also this can be just a buzzword but we i think we have been able to implement a fast learning culture which is was not easy but um, we made steps and if, just to mention a few words about hero and the learning curve with hero it one of our main uh, learning is decide fast about the the main field you want to go in or the main domain you want to go in with this tool and then do it there build the interface there uh, and really concentrate on finding use cases there there and exactly there um, and then also to really be ready and willing to do the invests take it takes some time till you till till we have been ready with all these uh, interfaces we need to build with the security approvals we needed um, that was a ramp up and <clears throat> at the beginning uh, everybody thinks it's faster than it, than it really is uh, so you have to to be patient uh, in, in, in that point that was our experience yeah hey Roger um, thank you one last, sorry one last point I really want to yeah. mention that we had we had uh, also issues together with Arago I mean Tom and Patrick know them <laughs> very well we, we have not come to a to a clear learning fast enough, but this changed during second half of last year very much. And since then, we 
we uh, have good results. Yeah, no. Hey, Roger, thank you so much. I think uh, these are great practical learnings. Uh, and I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'll, we've been asking a lot of questions um, through the session. But um, I think we have time for one more question. And I'd like to uh, ask Patrick uh, this one, which is a really interesting question, which is, can we expect AI-based systems to develop moral values, ethical values in the future? Would that be possible? Patrick, given you are the product manager for Arago, what's your take on that? The, in the, so that's the crystal ball question. And uh, <laughs> if I knew the answer, I'd, I'd be, I'm sorry to be the, the trite answer, which is if I knew the answer, I'd probably be doing my own startup in that area. <laughs> um, the way that AI works today is, uh, is automation of the predictable. So this is where we get into a lot of the discussions that you hear today about uh, is your data biased or not? Because the way that it works today uh, from our, our data, our engine is not necessarily different from everybody else's engine and we all face the same issues is that <clears throat> it picks up the ethical, moral and biases of the data set that it is using. So if the data is biased, it's going to be biased. If we put in, uh, to currently, if we, uh, whatever moral set or ethical set, because uh, they vary across the world, but whichever one we base the decisions on or base what we train it on, that will show up in the AI today. Will it be able to uh, develop moral and uh, ethical in the future. I don't know where this is going to take us, uh, but what I do know is that if we look at it from today looking forward, <clears throat> it is making predictions based on data sets provided, or it is applying rules based on data that is being provided to it. So the moral and ethical values that it will pick up will, will be those that are embedded in the data set and that data set is inevitably, inevitably selected by and tagged by uh, someone in order to pick that, whatever the, that biases that person has. And you can see the great differences in approach in this and how it's being applied in different countries. Uh, China has one way of looking at it, America another way, from a privacy perspective, Europe a different way. Those AIs will actually evolve differently It'll be very interesting to see if some of the AIs in China in particular where uh, privacy rights are completely different, how those would behave in different environments because the data sets will be very coming from a very different starting point. So that's the key to bias and moral ethics is it's all today, it's all in the data source and how that is selected. Yeah, so it seems the human race has uh, some runway to, to keep existing. And on that positive note, uh, I think we've had a fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I hope our, just by looking at the number of questions that we got through the session, we weren't able to answer all of them, but we will make sure that we follow up um, with the unanswered questions. Um, one of the questions that we've been asked a number of times is whether these slides and the session will be recorded. The answer is yes. Uh, it will be posted on our website uh, very soon in the next couple of days. So thank you everyone for joining, for listening in. And thank you, uh, Roger, Patrick, Tom, and Tapti for sharing your insights. Uh, I think this was, this was a great discussion. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.